For more than two years, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has shown what high-intensity modern conflict looks like. Now, while most of the discussion has been focused on high-tech equipment, such as long-range missiles, drones, and air defenses, the less sophisticated but equally important topic of the use of decoy targets went relatively untouched, and for good reasons. For one, neither Ukrainians nor Russians want to publicize their decoy tactics and, more importantly, their effectiveness rates. Both keep this information a closely guarded secret. To understand the true effectiveness of decoys, one of the few sources of information comes from China. According to Chinese battlefield analysis, a one-to-one -one ratio between real and decoy targets increases the survivability of friendly forces and equipment by 40%. Furthermore, the Chinese claim that having three decoys to one real target increases enemy munitions consumptions by 70% and increases survivability by an additional 50%. To appreciate the significance of these numbers, a very smart Chinese man famously wrote, All warfare is based on deception. Hence, when able to attack, we must seem unable. When using our forces, we must seem inactive. When we are near, we must make the enemy believe we are far away. But how drone operators could estimate the weight of a decoy by just looking at it? Why Russians built fake camps of theatrical proportions that are extremely easy to spot by Ukrainians? How candles were used to trick the enemy into wasting their ammunitions? And why Russian decoy tanks are nicknamed rubber product number two is not what you think. When it comes to the Ukrainian doctrine for the use of decoys, it's pretty simple. Employ as many decoys as possible to draw away Russian fire from high-value targets. And there is no better example of this tactic than the extensive use of fake HIMARS rocket launchers. Back in the summer of 2022, Russia claimed that they had destroyed 44 HIMARS launchers. At the time, everyone was mocking Russia and making fun of their claims. The Russians were not lying. They really did believe that they had destroyed 44 HIMARS. But the reality was that at the time, the United States had only sent 16 HIMARS launchers to Ukraine. The Russian army had simply fallen prey to decoy warfare. Inflatable warfare. A piece of this puzzle became public a year later, in spring of 2023 when a Czech company, Inflatech Decoys, stated that they produce about 35 inflatable HIMARS launchers per month. But the company refused to say how many inflatable decoys they have sent to Ukraine. Although I think we can connect the dots. The use of inflatable decoys is of course not a new idea. During World War II, thousands of inflatable decoys were deployed to create phantom armies that threatened Pas de Calais in northern France as part of Operation Fortitude. The reason was simple, to divert Germany's attention away from Normandy. After the invasion of Normandy by the Allies on June 6, 1944, also known as D-Day, the Phantom Field armies played a role in convincing Germans that Normandy landings were merely a diversionary attack, which in turn made Germans delay sending reinforcements there. This was an example of decoys being used on strategic level. But for what exact reason are decoys used today? The first reason to use decoys is to save the lives of military personnel. Every rocket that hits a decoy is one less rocket that can endanger military personnel. Here's a life hack. If you ever end up on a battlefield, bring a mannequin with you. This would theoretically increase your chances of survival by 40%, which is why both Russians and Ukrainians have been using mannequins. One famous example was during the early days of the Russian invasion. Ukrainian forces procured a massive amount of mannequins during the Battle of Kharkiv in order to confuse the oncoming Russian first tank army. As the Russians attacked trenches manned with mannequins and fake checkpoints, they were ambushed from other sites. This allowed Ukrainians to outmaneuver the Russians, who were eventually forced to withdraw from the city. 
The second reason is that decoys would force the other side to waste resources and ammunition to hit fake targets. Fake high-value targets force the enemy to waste long-range FPV drones and artillery shells, like the Russian Lancet drone that costs over $30,000 or a Krasnopol precision artillery round which costs over $35,000. And the economics of decoys makes their use a no-brainer. For example, the American M777 howitzer costs a few million dollars, but a decoy would only cost a few thousand dollars. The third reason to use decoys is a tactical one. Decoys force the enemy to believe that the opponent is stronger than it really is. This often makes the adversary disperse its forces to less than desirable locations. Additionally, decoys can distract the enemy for several hours to a few days, which buys the other side invaluable time. But there is a problem with decoys, and that arose from the invention of HDTV. Back in the day, decoys could be produced with low quality and still be effective. But in the age of drones with HD cameras, it's increasingly becoming apparent that you need high-quality decoys. Inflatable decoys are easy to spot by professional FPV operators, so they're becoming less popular. This is why rubber decoys are now widely replaced with high-quality builds which are made from wood and metal. This makes them more expensive to build, but still economical and effective. Interestingly, people who design, build, and install decoys don't care so much about the number of decoys produced. What's important to them is the number of decoys destroyed. If a decoy design does not attract enemy fire, that means it's a bad decoy, so the designers go back to the drawing board to make it more realistic. This is why the amount of details on modern decoys is increasing with spinning antennas and even electromagnetic signature emitters. Some decoys are equipped with heating elements to make them appear realistic to FPV drones that have thermal cameras. And this brings us to candles. This is the Red Army in the forest, which looks like a bunch of pink flamingos. But in reality, it's just Russian mannequins that aim to distract Ukrainian FPV pilots. And here is a bunch of more mannequins on the boats in the forest. Fishing, I guess. Now here's the kick. Russians put candles inside some mannequins to trick Ukrainians into wasting their FPV drones equipped with expensive thermal cameras. Ukrainian FPV pilots admit the cleverness of this Russian tactic and how they fell for it on previous occasions. No matter how real a decoy looks, it lacks one thing, and that's real weight. Remember that M777 decoy? It's made from wood and sewage pipes and weighs only 880 pounds, which is 10 times lighter than the real howitzer. Similarly, a decoy tank is substantially lighter than a real one, which is a big problem, because decoys don't leave track marks on the road or grass. So just by looking at the surrounding environment, one could determine that it's fake. Luckily, there is a solution for this, inspired by real estate agents. Location, location, location. What's as equally critical as the quality of decoys is their placement. According to Ukrainians, it's incredibly important to place decoys where real equipment had been stationed previously. This allows decoy to leverage the existing environmental footprints from the actual equipment, making them look even more convincing. Here is a rare video of a destroyed Ukrainian artillery decoy, which was located at a spot where previously a real artillery system had been used. Note other environmental footprints, like empty shell casings in the surrounding area. Similarly, Russians place decoys where actual equipment was once used before. But they also do the opposite and build entire fake positions from scratch. But why? You see, assembling forces beyond the platoon 
which is between 20 to 50 troops, is a very dangerous endeavor on the modern battlefield. With constant flow of reconnaissance information from the aerial drones, it is possible to detect the movement of the troops even before they get to the front lines, which takes away the element of surprise. But the use of decoys provides some mitigation against persistent intelligence flow. In this case, Russians have built an elaborate fake refueling position, which involves mannequins doing the refueling, while the driver is sitting inside the car and enjoying some Pringles. There is even a mannequin fixing the fuel pump. There are also lots of camouflage nets and more mannequins and vehicles. Here is some laundry drying, and here is a mannequin using the bathroom. Now this whole thing is so obviously fake that Ukrainians won't waste any resources attacking it. Which begs the question, why are Russians building them? The reason for creating such a fake position is a little bit counterintuitive. Russians purposefully make it easy for Ukrainians to find and identify these compounds as fake. But then it becomes a waiting game. Russians would wait a day or a week before they replace the fake tanks and mannequins with real forces. This allows them to ambush unsuspecting Ukrainian forces who had got accustomed to this fake position. In some other instances, Russians have used fake compounds and trenches like this, filled with mannequins that are booby-trapped and are triggered when Ukrainians enter them. Decoys are only part of a greater toolkit in modern warfare, which includes mobility, concealment, and deception. When it comes to mobility, remember that in this day and age, aerial and satellite surveillance allows for real-time reconnaissance. So just having fake targets is not enough. When they are identified as fake, they need to be moved. When it comes to concealment, there is really no end to creativity. Just take a look at this mortar position, where Russians went above and beyond to conceal themselves. Now it resembles a grave, so it will work no matter what happens. When it comes to concealing the movement of your forces, smoke screens still work, according to Russians. But Ukrainians tend to disagree by firing cluster munitions at them. Finally, deception. Whether it's Russia painting aircraft on their airfields, or launching inert or obsolete missiles, as well as cheap Iranian drones to divert attention of Ukrainian air defenses. It's all part of the toolkit, but how do you identify a decoy? In many cases, decoys become apparent only after they have been targeted and the footage of their destruction has been analyzed. In this case, what gave away that this was a decoy was the unnatural green color of the Ukrainian artillery system and the lack of personnel nearby. In this other scenario, Russians thought they were targeting the Ukrainian artillery system, but it turned out to be a decoy. This is evident by the lack of secondary explosions and also pieces of plywood flying up in the air. But why are Russian inflatable decoy tanks nicknamed rubber product number two? See, the Soviet Union was an interesting country, where everything that was ever made had a number. In case of rubber products, rubber product number one was a gas mask, rubber product number three was an eraser, rubber product number four was boots, and rubber product number two was condoms. So whenever Soviets went to the pharmacy to buy condoms, they would simply ask for rubber product number two, and the cashier knew exactly what it meant. Russian decoy tanks and early Soviet-era condoms are both made out of rubber and are easy to spot. But only one can provide real protection.